Good morning, good afternoon. I give you a warm welcome to this online webinar on climate change, migration, and health in Latin America and the Caribbean. I am Baltica Cavieses, and I run the, the research center at the University of Chile. The goal of this webinar is to reflect on this complex dynamic on climate change, international migration and public health in Latin America and the Caribbean based on a strong association between the co-organizing institutions. This series of webinars will present the evidence from around the region and real life experiences from around the region and its communities, which are heterogeneous and dynamic. For this cycle of webinars, we have simultaneous interpretation from uh, Spanish into English. Please check in the bottom of your screen an icon that is shared like a blog like a globe to select and to listen this webinar in English in real time. The recording of this webinar and all of the other webinars will be available for you to view in your own time in the website of, for this activity where you are enrolled. This is organized together with ISIM and the School of Psychology for Development in Chile, together with the Global Consortium on Global Change and Health Education in Columbia University in the United States, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, the Chilean Re Network of Health and Migration Research, Lands and Migration and is, and also the Department of Health and Migration of the Central World Health, uh, Health Organization in Geneva is also supporting this webinar. Remember that you have simultaneous interpretation from English and to Spanish. You can also participate with uh, any questions that you may have in the Q&A section or in the chat. We ask all panelists in this session to please speak slowly so that the, our interpreters can do their job accurately. We can uh, make our questions in the Q&A in writing. They will be read at the end of this webinar. We will attempt to read and answer all questions and comments. If any are pending at the end of the webinar, we will try. We will make our best to answer at a later time. Today, we will look at how climate change is affecting and changing women's health in Latin America and the Caribbean. Migrant women of, of all ages, ethnicities, cultures, and backgrounds provide essential care to others and are a significant part of the development of their communities for themselves and others, protecting the health of both their families and communities providing comfort and to their families, communities, and at a larger scale, their countries. There is a large proportion of migrants who are women and even larger than male migrants in some countries. Female abilities connected to gender and at the same time, migrant women develop unique and powerful resources and resilience during transit and also in their host societies. The connection between climate change 
and the health of migrant women in Latin America and the Caribbean has been poorly explored to this date. In this webinar, we will expand the evidence-based knowledge that we have about this in this region, about how climate change is transforming the health of women, both uh, the ones living in a process of transit and those living in our countries. First, we will have a presentation by Beatrice Vila, who works on migration, climate change, and health for the Organiza International Organization for Migrations in San Jose. She's an attorney, has worked in Spain and in Central America, and she works as a specialist at the IOM. Uh, please, um, Beatriz, I'll give you the floor, and I appreciate you joining us at the border uh, between knowledge and experience in a region. You have 20 minutes. When I turn on my camera, that will mean you have two minutes. And please remember that you are being interpreted so that you can speak accordingly. Thank you so much. And you have the screen. Thank you so much, Baltica, for having me, for giving a space for the IOM to present here. You can see my presentation, right? Yes, yes. Well, just to go into the topic, I'm going to present specifically about one of the specific projects we have here in Costa Rica uh, with strategies, adaptation strategies as tools to address the issues associated with climate change, migration and health. I'm going to give you a bit of context and then I'm going to go into how our strategy is helping communities, specifically migrant women, to adapt to climate change and how this affects their health. A bit of a generic context to understand what the IOM's view is on climate change and human mobility. Our organization recognizes that climate change is one driver of migration. And our view is to recognize the need to increase national, regional, and international efforts to address the challenges to human mobility associated to environmental factors and climate change. And our vision of migration, the environment and climate change is that the governance of migration policies and practices should reflect the relevance of environmental factors, disasters and climate change on human mobility. Environmental factors must be integrated into all of the areas that involve managing migration, both prevention, preparation, response, managing borders, migration for work reasons, integration, return, and reintegration. And our goals are in order to avoid forced migration derived from environmental factors to the extent possible, and we are working on that. However, when it's impossible to avoid that forced migration, the organization will provide assistance and protection to affected populations. When there are uh, environmental changes, climate changes, and try to find lasting solutions to the situation. So when there is a need to, to move, uh, 
to have it be to an area where the, that those people can stay for a long time or even permanently. And finally, to facilitate migration in the context of adaptation to climate change and improve the resilience of affected communities. So involving also the communities in the places that receive these migrants. So in the framework of these uh, goals, this project is uh, has to do with the, the first goal. So because our first goal is always to avoid forced migration for all of the reasons that are well known, one being that the causes for for these people and their effects on the health of migrants. So to understand the connection, the link between climate change, migration, and human health, we have people who are forced to migrate for climate change reasons, uh, disasters, hurricanes, floods, lack of access to stable sources of food, uh, lack of employment opportunities due to the soil degradation. And all of this has a direct impact on human mobility. We have uh, planned relocations in case of disasters. We also have migration that is uh, done to access healthcare, drinking water, these are very vulnerable communities that don't have adequate infrastructures. And when these populations are affected by climate change, the, high, the risk is a lot higher. And it's, a more likely, it's a lot more likely that they will move to better prepared um, places. The impacts of climate change on health, we have mental and physical impacts the mental health of people who have had to move is affected, but also they can suffer malnourishment, dehydration, and the people who are in transit can also suffer dehydration, injuries, death, trauma, uh, infectious diseases such as malaria, and many others that uh, directly affect the health of migrants, both in the communities that are affected by climate change and during their transit to a different community and also in the, that host community. Some approaches, including gender equity, uh, in forced migration or in disaster motivated migration. When there is forced migration or this relocation caused by disasters, gender becomes very relevant. It needs to cut across the entire response that we provide. It's key to understand environmental migration. In the case of uh, environmental migration, we need to understand that people who stay in these communities are usually women. Men usually migrate. So women are the ones uh, that need us to strengthen their tools for adaptation to have a way, find a way of life within those communities. In their origin, the community of origin, for them to have access to drinking water, uh, food safety, because many times they are the ones that remain in those communities. If the community has been affected, for example, by a disaster and the possibility of staying, living there is not possible, we need to make sure that the temporary housing that these people will get to take into account their gender. We also need to take into account the limited access to resources and opportunities that are influenced by gender uh, for either returning to the community of origin or for leaving it. Gender-based violence is also something that needs to be taken into account. 
when relocating or even during transit of migrant women, gender-based violence is something that needs to be considered when providing services by international organizations, NGO, and others. We need to consider gender-based violence as one of the factors that can affect women in transit or displaced women. And we need to uh, increase the evidence and the data in order to better tailor the policies to respond to events uh, that have to do with these kinds of, of migration or displacements. The characteristics of migrant women and need to be taken into account throughout every response, given in case of disasters or short term uh, climate change events. And now going into the project that we have in Costa Rica, this is a project that seeks to uh, plan uh, adaptation, to have adaptation plans to avoid migration, to improve the capacity of local governments to deal with the factors that drive environmental migration in the communities of Los Chiles and Puerto Jimenez, both include a gender-based approach, taking into account that many of the community leaders in these cases are women. We're going to describe the communities a little better in a, in a little bit. It's a two-year project. It's in the third phase, and it will be ending in November 2024. And we have worked in the communities of Los Chiles in the first map. It's a, a municipality that is quite large, quite big territory in the north of the country on the border with Nicaragua. And this means that there is a big population of migrants from Nicaragua. They are from a diaspora, they have lived a while in the country, but there's also a, quite a big population that comes and goes almost daily for crops. They live in the village that is in the border. So if you cross the street, you cross the country. The children go to school in Nicaragua, but they live in Costa Rica. So it's that's very common. And it's a municipality that has a large number of migrants. It's also the place that sees a large number of migrants who are in transit from Latin America to the US or Canada. This also means that they are exposed to lots of infectious diseases such as malaria and others. That these uh, migrants who are in transit are exposed to or carry because of the lack of access to health care and the conditions in which they are traveling. Uh, so they are at a much higher risk of contracting all of these diseases. So this is something that affects both the population that is in transit and the host community and puts a, a huge pressure on the healthcare infrastructure and services in these communities. So in Los Chiles, we are working on two specific communities, Cuatro Esquinas on the border with Nicaragua in the border mile, what they call, uh, that it's a place where neither Nicaragua or Costa Rica can intervene, so they, almost have no access to basic services because the public institutions of Costa Rica cannot do anything in that territory. So this makes people a lot more vulnerable. And we also have Nueva Esperanza, which is the community we are going to focus on to explain this project that is closer to a place called Caño Negro, which is one of the most important wetlands in the country that is protected as a national park. 
we also have another part of the project in the south of the country in a region which is the Osa Peninsula in the Puerto Jimenez municipality and it has different uh, characteristics, very different from Los Chiles. We won't focus on this one because of time issues. But yes, it, we, we have two specific areas in the countries. Uh, climate change associated risk in Costa Rica, we have the change in precipitation levels with the increase in extreme events, floods and droughts in the uh, short, mid, long term, and also increased temperatures. Have a look at this map. The temp high temperatures will increase and in, will affect the north where we're working now. And this is one of the reasons why we chose this region to start implementing the pilot project. Uh, also, what affects Los Chiles in particular? Floodings, 100% of agricultural, farms have a high risk or medium risk to floodings and also the uh, streets have a high, at high risk. Uh, drought, 76% of the farms are at medium and medium high risk. Uh, and wetlands, um, I will be talking about this community later on, they 100% the communities depend on the wetlands and the wetlands are also at a high risk. And this will directly affect the livelihoods of these people and their access to uh, water as well. Heat waves, this is also very important regarding how this affects the health of people. 92% of the population are at a high risk of being affected and this is quite influential because many of the migrants and the people that live in Los Chiles work on agriculture and on harvesting activities as well. And this might affect their health if temperature increases and these people need, uh, also because these people usually work during the, uh, uh, the hours of the day that have higher temperatures. So there might be some heat strokes, uh, increasing heat stroke figures, etc. And also many of these people, migrants, are not, do not have a, a, a legal status and they might not have access to the Costa Rican health um, system. If there's an emergency, they will, of course, uh, provide care, but uh, not in other cases. And landslides, well, the, the, the risk is low. No esperanza. There are no health centers in the two communities where we work with a local center. People need to move. Uh, people need to go to other places. In Los Chiles, we have the, the largest health center, and that, of course, impacts the health of people. 55% of the population in the municipality have a medium and high vulnerability rates. Los Chiles is a region with the lowest social security coverage in the country. And there are a lot of irregular migrants. These people are not covered by the health insurance system and that affects their health directly. Over 40% of the aggregate value of the municipality um, uh, corresponds to agricultural activities, therefore, uh, there, there is food insecurity, there might be malnutrition, dehydration, heat strokes, and the risk of suffering all these problems is very high in the municipality. Uh, the project and how we addressed it. We want to help people better understand what this project is about. The project should be something, we wanted it to be something we would build with the community. We wanted the community uh, to uh, appropriate the project. As I said, most community leaders, especially in Esperanza, are women. And it's a, a very nice group of women that we have been working with in the last two years, almost two years. We have built 
We have created the diagnostic activity, also the climate change adaptation strategy. And we have conducted awareness raising workshops. It has been very nice. They have brought their children to the workshops, for instance. And we have been able to raise awareness, the awareness of young people as well. Uh, it was a very nice activity. We wanted to include a gender perspective throughout the process. So uh, from gender, how we could harness the skills of the women living here so that we would help them become more resilient and to help them adopt change in their communities as well. And then also how participation of women and their empowerment in developing the uh, proposals for the third phase of project. Uh, nowadays, we have the Nueva Esperanza community, which is close to the Cañon Negro wetland. It does have some restri restrictions regarding agriculture because this is a national park. So there is a reserve area around the national park and the government is reluctant to providing specific agricultural permits. There are many restrictions, etc. cetera. There were, there were a few agricultural farms there close to the wetland. And it was very important for them to uh, provide uh, for us to provide technical assistance so that we would imp they would improve water and soil conservation strategies uh, when it came to agricultural activities so that we would promote climate adaptation as this was done from the perspective of young women uh, young people and women they wanted to organize us to organize workshops so we have a multi-stage strategy. The uh, OIM would be uh, funding some of these strategies. We will be mapping the, the farms participating in the project. We would like to have a, a, a major gender representation when selecting the farms. If there are uh, women agri um, producers or farmers, that would be ideal. We want to promote the participation of women in agriculture, which is already quite high in Los Chiles, and also how to ensure the food security of women and of the families, as we have been saying. Many times, women are the caretakers. So we will be diagnosing the situation. We will be providing training on water and soil conservation and then the municipality will implement these practices and also we will be exchanging knowledge between um, different communities this community and neighboring communities how will this strategy affect health first of all we will ensure um, the right access to water and sanitation. We will also be able to control waterborne diseases and uh, zoonotic diseases. And also we will help women so that they can provide, they can respond to climate change events in the area. So that's basically our uh, what we have to share today. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Beatriz, for this full presentation that is so interesting so that, so that we can get to know a bit more about Central America and Costa Rica in particular. I think Beatriz's presentation helps us reflect on how climate change and its challenges are unique to each territory and how in those territories being affected by climate change, uh, how they also include uh, human mobility and migration processes. And the gender perspective is essential for help, uh, to help uh, 
women feel empowered to promote economic recovery and also to help the families that live there. These are um, uh, these are complexity layers that actually make this process dynamic, interesting, and of course challenging. Thank you so much, Beatriz. Now I would like to give the floor. Sorry, now we'll have the comment section. We have three expert uh, experts in climate and health. First of all, Alexandra Bach. She's an, a, a social anthropologist. She has an MA in gender studies and a PhD in social studies. She's the executive director of the Intercultural Institute at the University of Desarrollo, Chile. She works with the behavior of different human groups the, and their relationship with health. She has focused on studying interculturally, intercultural, uh, intercultural issues, identity in different contexts, including health environments. In the last few years, she has focused on the health of young people and adolescents, mainly in the areas of reproductive and sex uh, health. Dear Alexandra, thank you very much for being here today. You have about uh, five to seven minutes. You can uh, react to what Beatriz has said. Her work comes from the Center of Latin America and the Caribbean, and now we will provide the Chilean perspective. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Baltica. Thank you so much for the invitation uh, to be here commenting on this presentation made by Beatriz. Thank you so much. Um, Beatriz talks about the major um, effort made in our region to address these topics. I would like to say that the health of women, girls and adolescents is an international, international concern nowadays. After decades of um, being neglected, given the lack of uh, gender mainstreaming in the analysis of social policies that have allowed us to address the inequality gap of uh, suffered by women and other minorities in highly patriarchal societies. Uh, women are a priority are a priority for international development, and this is reflected in, for instance, different initiatives and, and different SDGs. For instance, SDG 5, gender equality, which aims to create an impact for women, but also they're involved in SDGs, SDGs 1, 3, 10, and all the SDGs. Because nowadays we know that in every culture and society, women are essential pillars to help communities develop. Therefore, there is agreement that women, children, uh, girls and adolescents globally in, and in Latin America and the Caribbean live in greater poverty and social inequality. And also from an intersectional uh, perspective, these vulnerabilities include if they, they are women and also indigenous, migrants, etc. So as many authors say, they are the last link of the social chain. We also know, as confirmed by Beatriz's presentation, that the new challenges and risk contents globally, such as climate change and its consequences, uh, expose women, girls, and adolescents to scenarios that make them even more vulnerable than other social groups, given the uh, inequalities and other problems that they need to suffer every day, also food insecurity, health. And this all is made worse in a climate change and social change environment. We need to promote the agenda to showcase the specific vulnerabilities of women, girls, and adolescents in the uh, climate change context. And we also need to identify the main risks they need to face. This is a necessary step in order to safeguard the well being of these populations. There is already enough evidence that. Um, Migration, uh, the, the migration affects the physical, sexual, and uh, and sexual health of uh, mental health of women. We need to protect them because they need to protect their children. Uh, they are responsible for them during this migration process, and when they do this. They need to suffer terrible conditions. This we have seen in Chile and other Latin American and Caribbean countries where in the last few years, 
uh, crossing borders uh, it, uh, now entail terrible uh, conditions for women, girls and adolescents. Also in Chile, some uh, migrant settlements, mainly undocumented uh, migrants, they are located in risk in high risk areas uh, that might suffer landslides, fires, etc. And these uh, dangers have increased because of climate change. Most of these housing units are led by migrant women, and very little has been done to revert to reverse this situation because they live in very poor conditions and these conditions will be worse each year given the uh, extreme climate events we see and the uncertain scenarios we face given the reality of climate change and its specific manifestations in our region uh, mean that we need to uh, put in place different protection strategies to protect vulnerable people as women, girls and adolescents. Nowadays, what Beatriz is saying has to do with the different paths for the future that we need to uh, promote in order to help communities face climate change and to address these problems and to mainstream gender from the very beginning. We need to engage different people so that women can also be uh, main actors in their whole future. We welcome these initiatives uh, especially in Costa Rica, given how in Latin America and the Caribbean migration in general is not paid attention to. Uh, and we need to include this perspective, this gender perspective as well. We need to learn based on experience, given some risk context, and also humankind has been through all this. And actually, women and girls have been left behind in this regard. And this has had terrible consequences for them. All of this uh, makes it mandatory to create plans for the future given climate change so that women, girls, and other minorities become a priority and where we uh, do not leave them behind as we did in the past. We need to see if that in the current societies that are still patriarchal, we can uh, place them first. Thank you. Thank you, dear Alex, for uh, commenting on um, Beatrice's presentation that have, uh, focused on climate change and gender, because you're talking about women, about girls, about the, uh, the associated vulnerabilities. And this has to do with the human mobility in many cases. And you have also deeply reflected on climate change and its uh, impacts. Thank you so much. Now let us go to Dr. Rachel Soeya. She's a specialist in global health with over 15 years of experience uh, uh, on in Africa and Brazil. She's an assistant professor at the State University of Campinas in Brazil. Rachel will be, I think she will be speaking in English. Is that right, Rachel, in English? Um, as you wish. And if not, you please go to English, okay? So that we, because we have interpretation. Thank you so much, Rachel, for being here today. It's an honor to have you here. You bring, you bring your expert perspective from the global South uh, and also Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you, Beatriz, for your presentation. It's been an excellent presentation. I will be talking about our reality in Brazil. We are now going through something that is clearly the climate change. And there's also floodings in the south of the country. Uh, you know, climate change is so clear nowadays. Eight months ago, we had the same type of flooding in the same region in Brazil. It was exactly like this eight months ago. Women are the most affected ones. And it's always women 
in vulnerable and sensitive groups or groups that have become more vulnerable, for instance, migrants. Here we have many migrants from Venezuela, but also many uh, migrant women from Haiti and other countries in Latin America and also from African countries. We also have populations uh, that have been displaced from other regions of Brazil to the south. And right now with the floods, for example, we have 40,000 people who have been displaced. And if we look at it, it's most of them are women. Historically, we know that women have a burden of, of labor that includes work outside of, of the home and also domestic labor. I'm going to bring some numbers from a survey conducted in Brazil that shows that women here dedicate almost twice the time on average 21 hours um, a week, uh, whereas women, uh, men dedicate 11 uh, hours a week to take care of children. As for uh, salaried uh, labor, women earn a lot less than men and black uh, women earn around 50% less than, than white men. So the disparities are quite clear. Those women live in, in areas that are the most affected by extreme weather events, such as these floods that we have right now. So they will be the affected the most to all, by all those issues, landslides, floods inside their homes. And also now that they're displaced, they need to take care of the elderly and the children. There's also food security. Uh, women in general are the ones that are going to contribute the most to looking for food and and also the, the ones that are responsible for, for the economy, but the, the finances but inside the home. So women are the ones that are at the the forefront of all of these actions. So as Beatriz uh, very clearly showed in her presentation, we need to involve these women, these community leaders to empower them to be able to deal with all of these risks, risks that they're exposed to. So that was my contribution. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your comment, for doing this, uh, complimenting this, our view with uh, information from Brazil, Costa Rica, Chile, uh, with this uh, perspective from climate change, um, migration and gender, uh, with all the specific features that our territory has, with all of its diversity in culture, um, political perspectives, historical context, with deep inequalities, with colonialism, where climate change is bringing pressure and a sense of urgency, but our healthcare systems locally are, are not being able to deal appropriately. And so we have a, this global and international political perspective. And now I have Catherine Galas, who works at the School of Social Sciences in Chile. She has a doctorate from the University of Barcelona. She co-coordinates the gender and feminist approaches um, group of the University of Chile, and she's also at the CLACSO group of migra South, South Migrations. She has specialized on public policy, 
social intervention on transnational uh, migration, sexualities, and gender. It's lovely to have you here with us today, Catherine, in this challenge to bring this to the intersection between migration, climate change, and gender. We are so happy to have you here, and you have the floor right now. Thank you so much, Baltica, for your introduction. Also, thank you, Beatriz Vila, for your presentation. I think it's really important to stress how gender is put at the forefront uh, of the displacements and the role that you have in your communities, and also taking into account the effects uh, that all of this has on health. We know that climate change is a driver of migration, but it, it also ends up being a determinant of um, health for these people. This shows the effort that the IOM is doing, shows how important it is to connect climate change to address its effects on health, but also the role that women have in those spaces, because many of them stay in those places that have the most difficulties, so they need that support. And also they need and they have the technical expertise to deal with the consequences of climate change. This project also brings to the to the light the effects also on mental health and it's important to see that these um, migration waves needs to be need to be looked under the lens of inequalities gender inequalities nationalities and how all of those also end up being uh, social uh, health determinants for these populations. In Chile, we are dealing right now with droughts, with lack of water, and this is having a diverse range of effects, not only driving international displacements, but also internal displacements. And also due to the intense uh, activities of some companies, there are different activists, activist movements, also led by women trying to bring attention to this. We also have uh, earthquakes and floods in other countries have also uh, led populations to move around the continent towards our country. For example, after the earthquake in Haiti, we had a significant number of Haitians coming into the country. And there were a lot of um, problematic uh, in uh, situations. Uh, racism was really evident. There were language issues. There was a case of institutional violence against a Haitian woman, a, a Haitian woman who ended up dying uh, their certification, the, the deterioration of the soil is making it so that in some areas of the country, people have to leave, especially younger people. And many times they are uh, the ones who are left in the areas that have the, the problems are women and elderly women. Uh, as I was saying, we have a water crisis right now. So this is causing a lot of displacement. We also have the sacrifice area, in, which are some land areas that have some extractive industrial uses where a lot of people uh, who are vulnerable uh, are living some indigenous communities, low income communities. And there we have migrants also arriving in those areas from another from other countries. And this also uh, has an influence on 
health issues because of the lack of healthcare resources, uh, medical care, and also due to the exposure to um, environmental contaminants, uh, air pollution, they live in precarious conditions. They're more exposed to those, those contaminants and that, that causes different diseases. And there, there's limited access to services. Also, the work that is available is in risky industries such as mining. So we see a large number of people uh, of foreigners are being used in those risky occupations. So we not only have the more general environmental uh, changes, but also the these intensive high-risk industries and also these local focalized projects, such as the one that was presented from Costa Rica with the involvement of women are very important and they should be promoted to face the challenges that brings not only climate change, but also the, the effect of, effects of these industries on the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, so much for your reflections that complement the others. You are placing the emphasis on the agency and resistance of women who are community leaders and family leaders, but also in dialogue with those spaces that have to do with these extractive industries that uh, not always are well regulated within the framework of climate change and also that how that links to migrant populations who are also uh, working under regular conditions so work and migration who are that are so closely connected also overlap and there's like a we have the gender perspective as a vector um, also showing these specific challenges. So thank you so much, Katherine, for your reflections. And now we are going to into the Q&A. And so I'm going to ask all our panelists to turn on your cameras. Rachel, Alexandra, Beatriz, Katherine. And we're going to start with some questions from the Q&A section for Beatriz. There you are. This question in the chat is, could you go deeper into how this project that you presented will ensure food security? Thank you so much. Yes, it's a very interesting question. As I was saying, this uh, project uh, uh, brought different strategies and this is one that was uh, specifically selected by the IOM to strengthen the technical capacities to uh, for soil and water conservation. And what the IOM will do is a diagnosis on how the, the farms, the, the cattle farms in the area are to in this territory to select the ones that will take part in this pilot plan to see how they are handling the water, the soil, what kind of, of rain problems are they having? Uh, too, uh, too much rain and flood or too little rain and, and droughts? What kind of practices can be implemented to improve their productivity? To uh, also in, in farms to see how we can conserve water in order for crops not to be affected and also soil management to prevent uh, acidification. So the soils are going to be uh, studied to see whether they need regeneration and what techniques 
can be used for that regeneration to be sustainable in time. So how we can ensure the, the crops at the end of, of each period. So with those, uh, with the crops uh, directly to the population, what, what we have is access to food to ensure food security and to prevent malnourishment. Thank you, Beatriz. And I think you kind of already answered this, but there's another question that says, how can this project be sustainable in time and how can the capacity developing be um, maintained but also improved? I think that uh, also uh, includes asking how can we systematize these kinds of experiences and adapt them to areas with other complexities. Well, this was quite innovative in the project. I think we also had a result that wasn't thought of in the project, but what was uh, ended coming up as a result that was great. The idea was to involve the local government, local communities. And for example, there's INDER is a public institution that provides support to cooperatives and um, that work in agriculture with machinery. They provide loans, uh, technical uh, training. So it was really important to have this set of public institutions integrated from the start of the project so that they were providing the, the services. So for the adaptation, for example, in Los Chiles, the adaptation plan they have is derived from the plan that it, they have at the municipal level. And so what we did is bring that down and adapt it to those two smaller communities. So the product that we're going to give to them along with the strategies developed with the community based on their specific needs, is a document that belongs to the municipality. And within the specific strategies that the IOM is going to give, the first three phases are funded by the IOM, the diagnosis, the workshops, and mapping all of the, the institutions and all that. But the follow-up on the implementation of those practices that we have taught or given to this community of uh, farmers are the public institutions and the local government. And they themselves are in charge of having an exchange of ideas with surrounding communities. And there the IOM isn't even involved. We don't have funding for that. We might be uh, listening in or participating, but we don't have funding for that. That is work that they are going to be doing with those uh, local communities and public institutions that are supporting the strategy. So our idea is for us to finish stage three in the workshops, we leave and it becomes a project that is owned by the municipal government and also all of the methodology from all of the workshops, including the diagnosis for an ad community adaptation plan, all of the workshops for generating the strategies, that methodology included the participation of all public institutions. And so that methodology is going to be delivered to the municipality so that they can then use that in other local communities to replicate that. And we can identify the characteristics, the specific traits of each community to be able to develop specific strategies for those communities. So both the water and soil conservation workshops can be replicated, but also the entire methodology used. Uh, and then you will come out with, with specific strategies for each community, depending on their specificity. So it's thought of as a global strategy so that when the IOM 
leaves, the municipality can take charge and replicate this as many times as, as they want. Thank you so much, Beatriz. It's quite clear how uh, from the beginning, the outcome uh, is considering uh, the responsibility and who is going to be in charge when they transfer the ownership of it in the long term and also how it can be adapted to similar uh, places. Thank you so much. Now we have some general questions. The first one, I'm going to see who wants to answer. I don't know who might want. How do climate change and migration affect women with disabilities and which policies are in place to uh, do something about this reality? Women migrants with a disability and climate change. Anyone who would like to say something from a given perspective? It's a very specific question about disability, which makes the, the answer quite challenging. Thank you, Valtica, for the question. I might want to answer this. It's very interesting. The, the question is very interesting. First of all, thank you, Beatriz, for your answer as well, because now it's much easier to ask a specific question about something that is being done to face climate issues as well. First of all, in Latin America and, Cari and the Caribbean in general, there is very limited research and interventions regarding that focus on climate change and migrations or human mobility. And if we add a gender perspective to all these things, uh, become quite more complex uh, in our progress as a region. So the question is quite innovative. Uh, it, it's a topic that we haven't explored enough, and we're already late because we see the consequences of climate change on communities for, uh, more, affecting more vulnerable communities. And this uh, means uh, there are many elements that were not included, so including so there are some populations that are already being affected. And there is a lack of quantitative data. There is lack of qualitative information as well. And also we need data about the context of what's happening in the region, which w w makes it difficult for us to take action. So the question uh, that addresses women with reduced mobility or some sort of disability uh, leads us to remember that we don't have specific program to programs to address uh, to help them. But we know that these are populations that are being left behind, and they will be groups. These are women with disabilities that will not be. be and they will be greatly affected by change. And also there are different issues with different industries or extractivism issues that have also exacerbated We could say that in a climate change context, the same thing might happen. Uh, we need a lot of research in this regard, but also what it's important in this kind of webinar is that we need to continue making progress. We need to uh, create, uh, we need to produce more evidence and also information and data that will allow us to analyze the current scenario because Clearly, this is already affecting us and we're not doing anything about this. 
uh, but here we have a community of women and they're interested in doing something and we need to uh, do something along the lines what Beatriz is saying. Thank you, Alexandra. Katy, your hand is raised. You have the floor. I would like to compliment what Alexandra said. In general, in Latin America, we have signed a number of agreements to protect uh, people with disabilities. But the, but policy making has been much more uh, difficult. For instance, I met with a migration officer in Chile. At the office, they don't have clear information about how many migrants we have migrants with disabilities. And this is a problem because the, the these data are never collected anywhere. So this is done, for instance, or we get the information when the people uh, seek uh, care services. We, we, we detect these people when they need help. And this shows the inequality as well, but we have very uh, limited data because we cannot collect the data. Even at the, with the national uh, census, national survey at the Statistics Institute, they never collect these uh, disaggregated data. So that on the one hand. Also last year, I participated in a project with Prodemo, which, which helps women develop in Chile. The, the project was implemented in Antofagasta and also in the south in Temuco. And as I said briefly at the beginning, the young, young people from isolated territories move to the cities and many times women are left behind in remote areas which lack services and many of them these women had some sort of acquired disability uh, so what alejandra alexandra says is important we do have women left behind in remote territories and <laughs> very difficult to reach by the state, especially because the south of the country has mobility issues. Uh, so these are indicators that show us that people with disabilities have greater problems and it's a topic we neglect and it's, it's, it's a topic we never address. Thank you. Thank you, Katarin. Beatriz. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues. As they're saying, there's very limited data that can actually tell us what's happening. Uh, but we do have specific examples. In the case of people in transit, many times we see that we, women traveling are not the ones that have a disability because to travel you need to walk so much but they usually take with them people that do have a disability and they are their caretakers so these uh, the, there's two specific examples in the south number one a family with a child who had epilepsy and the, the child needed to take a medication throughout the journey. They were Venezuelan, but they had migrated to Ecuador. In Ecuador, the medication was provided by the social security services. But when they started uh, traveling, they noticed that not every country covered, provided the medication. When they reached Costa Rica, they crossed the Darien, and they are stopped at the Costa Rican border because they tested positive for malaria. You know, extreme temperatures, stagnated water at the Darien, terrible uh, health conditions there. So they test positive for malaria. They are quarantined so that they're treated for malaria. 
and that's when we met this child, this boy that needed specific medi uh, epilepsy med medication. The, the the kid couldn't walk; he was in, in a wheelchair. They had the, his parents had been, uh, you know, carrying him um, from Venezuela, uh, and so what we did was buy this sort of like carrier for the child but we also told them they were going to the United States to get a miracle of uh, surgery for the kid but then Costa Rican doctors told them that 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 didn't exist what might happen is that they the kid might get fewer seizures but the child would never be a uh, a normal child and when they are told this they, they 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 get so stressed out because you know they left everything they had in ecuador and this doesn't really have to do with climate change but actually the whole uh, journey of these people was affected by uh, health vectors for instance that have increased because of climate change um, issues so these people uh, asked to be uh, sent back to Ecuador. How does this affect the caretakers of people with disabilities? It's not just the people with a disability themselves. In this case, it was the whole family and, uh, and, the, and the child's mom who has been carrying him all this way. Disability then affects all the members of one family. It's not a specific case. It, it might not affect the, the person with a disability directly. But th this is an issue which is global in nature. So sometimes they're not left behind. Sometimes the family uh, takes them with them, but it might affect them because this family needs to look after the family, the, the, the child, through a terrible journey, especially through the Darien, for instance, which is terrible. We might not have specific data to justify actions and policy, but still we know what happens, we know that this seriously affects the health of migrants that um, are traveling to another country. And it also affects the uh response by governments communities and international organizations and and how we need to help these people as well thank you beatriz it's also very interesting to uh, mention specific examples we might ha not have uh large data but we do have examples of real cases uh that help us detect what we need to do in the future for national and international policies Rachel, anything else you would like to say about this? And then we'll go on to the next questions. Yes. I have an example about Brazil because we always talk about vulnerable populations, migrants, uh, uh, women, indigenous women, people, women dis with disabilities. But two weeks ago, the Brazilian government launched uh, migration and health policy to help uh, populations in primary care health services. They talk about chronic diseases, mental health diseases, but they say nothing about people with disabilities. So I feel that, you know, people say a lot, but in practice, uh, people forget about uh, uh, people with disabilities. That's a weight example, uh, Rachel, about the, the evidence gap and uh, in countries. Thank you so much. Rachel, you go next, and then maybe the others. What can we do to make progress in this regard in Latin America and the region that has an intersectional gender perspective? Which specific recommendations would you make uh, for uh, health systems, educational systems, social policy making, administrations that will make us reflect. Um, this seminar already states that there are some examples, but there are also huge gaps. 
So which might be an expert roadmap, given your experience? Rachel, you go first. Thank you. Thank you, Baltica. Thank you for the question as well. I think that we always need to work together with civil society organizations because many times they are more advanced than governments. So I think that given the communities uh, and what they do, I think that climate change is a reality throughout Latin America with floodings and vector-borne diseases. Communi communities on the move will always try to find support services such as social assistance, civil society organizations. So governments need to work together to get to know uh, what's happening and to work throughout Latin America as well. Thank you, Rachel. Alexandra, would you like to say something? I think there's so much to do in the region. First of all, as I said before, we need to produce evidence and information about this topic so that we know which are the main priorities in our country. Because as Cathy said, many things affect us, lack of water, drought, but also we need to, we need to see how the North area, which is one of the, the, uh, the driest uh, globally. And we need to uh, see which factors affect more vulnerable areas regarding uh, different factors where we have migrants with terrible social conditions. So we need to make this part of the public agenda. We need to understand that these are problems that affect the entire region. And it's, it's a future problem. It's a current problem. And until now, we have found it very hard to identify this problem. We've had different types of limitations. We haven't been able to identify this as a problem. And this affects everyone, but specific populations in particular. And we have seen this in some uh, media. We have seen the, the, the floods. Beatriz also provides examples regarding what's happening in Central America with food insecurity uh, related to climate change. And this makes us do something about this and to understand uh, those and to understand, especially if we work with migration, how this topic, which is already complex, becomes more complex when we um, add the, the issue of different pandemics, uh, some other climate crises that uh, are here to stay. These are new, uh, we have new adaptation processes as a humanity, but also we need to create strategies to include everyone. And especially so that we uh, protect some vulnerable populations. And we need to also be careful not to promote unlimited development because this will harm a lot of people. We need to include, include a gender perspective. Yes, of course. It has been very difficult to mainstream gender in so many sectors, and now we need to include it in climate change as well. Thank you, Alexandra. Catherine and then uh, Rachel. Thank you. I agree with my colleagues. Uh, these displacements should also be addressed or considered forced displacement. There is no political crisis, okay, but these many people must leave their countries. And I think that international protection is failing. Um, you know, asylum seeking is failing. And also these tools that help communities should be strengthened. I think that internationally, globally, and especially in Latin America, 
uh, all of this has become so political, you know, the origin of the people, uh, the, the system they come from. And we forget to consider that um, some of these people have been forced to leave their countries. And we need to remember this. Also, I agree with Rachel when we talk about the responsibility of states before social communities and also as a corporate social responsibility. Uh, because many times people need to uh, leave their countries for several reasons. And this has to do with um, problematic areas and we need to create more services where there are new migrants. In many of these areas, there is a lack of schools, health, health services. And also uh, we need to, as Alexander was saying, we need to be aware of development, of economic development. Should we allow development to grow so much to, you know, uh, affect people so much. And Beatriz, before we give the floor to you, a question done by Bob Trader uh, that emphasizes the recommendations we may have for healthcare services. And please go ahead, Beatriz. Thank you so much. Uh, well, yes, uh, when we go into recommendations, I think the most important thing we can do is strengthen public institutions, uh, healthcare workers, and um, help them with how to respond to the needs of migrant populations. And what do I mean? It's not just ensuring access, but also having a healthcare system that is interculturally accessible to people, that the services provided by these healthcare uh, facilities take into account the specificities of these populations. Another project we have in our unit is uh, something that we're working on with the uh, with Costa Rica, we're working with the Ministry of Health on three specific access. We have in Costa Rica a large migrant population that is indigenous, that comes every year to collect coffee. Uh, the, when there are the crops, they cross the border at a specific time uh, from Panama. And this has been happening for years and years. Issues, well, the climate change is uh, changing the time, the timing of that, uh, of the, when the coffee crop is ready. And so the, the coffee beans fall to the ground, they rot, and when they come, there's no coffee to, to, collect, to pick. Many of these um, people didn't have access to healthcare, and for example, with COVID, the Panama and Costa Rica developed a tool that uh, recorded the migrants, the, these migrant workers, on a database because they were going to cross into Costa Rica to pick coffee. They would get an ID when they crossed the border. And so all of the owners of the farms had to put all of that people that was in that list into the healthcare insurance, the health insurance in Costa Rica. So they'd get that ID in the border and they can go to a healthcare facility to receive care. So we're not just making sure that they have access to healthcare, but also in the areas where they are, where they work, where they usually go to and they travel through, we are doing workshops for um, healthcare practitioners for them to get to know this population. For example, at the maternity of the hospital where they these people usually pick coffee, there's a specific uh, area uh, with the colors 
uh, that are important for them. The birthing method that they use with these ropes uh, hanging from the ceiling so that they can give birth according to their traditions. There was training for everyone in that maternity room to, to be able to communicate with this person. There's a cultural advisor that speaks both languages to be able to interpret for them and to uh, ensure that the, the indigenous woman that is giving birth there has uh, some guarantees. So all of this is done to make these healthcare facilities not only accessible, um, physically, but also for them to take into account the, the different cultures of the populations that go there. Another one of the products that we're going to be handing in at the end is for people who are in transit, um, ways that cases can be referred between the borders, for example, for cases of malaria. If someone who was in the border uh, on the southern border and they were not able to get scanned, uh, they give a warning to the northern border so that they can scan them and perhaps uh, continue treatment. There are some practices and things that are being done, but that hasn't been systematized yet. It's not on paper. So having guidelines to train workers so that the care that the people who are in transit receive uh, takes into account these specific uh, characteristics because we know that it's, a, that it's a population with different health parameters from the people that live in Costa Rica, but also that makes sure that they are followed up through as they pass through the southern and northern border. This is being done at the operational level in the countries to, to ensure accessibility and to for access to be multicultural. I would like to stress a couple of things that you said, the, the idea of having specific tools to make sure that we have continuity in treatment through those identity cards, to facilitate also places for um, uh, the, the creation of those jobs, to have those internal checks in the country, but also that intercultural sensitivity in some healthcare facilities that uh, has the challenge of including uh, climate change uh, related things. For example, a specific community with a specific culture that is moving because of climate change or uh, that need to, to be included in healthcare because of the mobility. I think all of those things are things that we still to see how we deal with uh, to provide continuity of care, to have gender sensibility as well. So thank you so much for those comments. And fortunately we have a little time, but a final question for Beatrice, you can give a short answer. Uh, we have had it for a while, but we hadn't been able to get to it. So I would like to know what were the main challenges you faced with the population to for this project? And if possible, can we access that methodology uh, to replicate it? Where can we find it? Thank you so much. Well, uh, challenges with the community. I think the biggest challenge and it's not just a challenge uh, from these two communities, but I think that is something uh, that exists worldwide is that people in their mind don't have an, a link between climate change and what is happening to me. Uh, it's not, I lost my job, my house was flooded, uh, it's uh, the heat is killing me, the crop is not as good as it used to be. All of these things that make me have to leave this place because it's unlivable. There's not a link between all of that that is happening to me and why. What is causing all of this, all of this accumulation of things that is on top of all of the other issues that we had, because these were populations that were already 
vulnerable due to poverty, due to uh, lack of access to public services and all of that. So these were already vulnerable populations. And then on top of all that, we have climate change. So these populations, for these populations, the biggest thing we had to do was to generate that link in their mind between everything that is happening to them and how it is a direct result of climate change that makes all of the vulnerabilities that already happened even more severe. So the workshops we did on climate change were key for people to understand that it's not something that is starting to happen just because, but that there's a scientific explanation for this and that it's not just their community that is going through this, but there are many communities affected by this same phenomena. And there are ways to deal with this, to adapt, but I need to understand why I need to adapt or why I need to change my the agricultural techniques that I use because there's this thing called climate change that is changing the, the entire agricultural calendar that I have been following for hundreds of years or the things that have been used for generations are no, no longer serving me. So I think that was the biggest challenge. And at the end of the project, what surprised us was the ability of these communities. We have one community that doesn't know how to read or write. So the work we had ahead of us was to be able to create that link without being able to show it in writing. So how can we work? What methodology can you use with this population for them to understand something as abstract as climate change is? that we even have scientists that are not able to grasp this concept. So how can we explain it to a, an illiterate population? So it was very interesting. And at the end, we were able to see that people do have the, the ability to make that link, to connect those ideas, and then be empowered and to learn that it, this isn't something that is happening to me and there's nothing I can do, but that they can be part of the change, that there are things they can do. And so that was uh, the biggest challenge and also the most satisfactory thing. And as for the methodology, we will be publishing them at the IOM website. If there's a link that you have, please put it in the chat so they can follow that. In the meantime, I will thank everyone. Uh, time flew by. We had very interesting presentations and reflections. We will see you in two months at the beginning of July to continue with this cycle of webinars. Thank you, everyone, and see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much.